Us, us, welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, today we're going to take a good look at the subject of transfer. Transfer is not necessarily something that people consider a lot, but it's a very important subject. And fundamentally what it means is how does the training you do transfer to practical and realistic technique, whether that technique is um, in a real confrontation or in tournament fighting, uh, you have to look at transfer and this subject of transfer and the degree to which the training you do transfers is the key to what I would say, one of the keys to what I would say is the difference between a good dojo and a bad dojo in that most Kyogushin dojos do the three Ks, the, the Kihon, the Kata and the Kumite, but how do they actually transfer over to realistic technique? Uh, and that's what we're talking about today. Absolutely. It's a fantastic topic. And Mitch, you've spent a bit of time looking into this because I can remember back when you were training with uh, Ian King, you actually came to one of our national camps and you gave a lecture on this subject of Oops. transfer. I don't yeah. know if you remember. But I do remember. Yes. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. And it's a topic that Ian King has studied. This is uh, a book called How to Transfer Strength Training. There we go. It's in the middle there. And uh, it's a fantastic book, dominantly on strength training, but it talks about all the, the different parts of transfer to sports. Um, but transfer is the reality of training. So as she, what Shian said at the start, we, we, there's a lot of scientific principles in training, but as Ian explained it to me and taught me over the years, it's the reality of what you do, how much does it actually transfer to what matters. Um, and it's a it's a great concept. And there's different areas that transfer as well, right? So we're, talk, we're going to be dominantly talking about um, transfer, technical transfer in terms of karate, the, the three Ks as you just said, Shian. But there's also transfer in the somatics or what's called the physical qualities. I don't know where you want to start with this, Sean. Well, I think that's a good place to start. And, and I think uh, it's very important because the science, it's not so much that the science is still not out. It's just the science actually conflicts. And I think quite often the science, you have to look at the outcome of the science depending on, you know, is it a, pri a pri priori or or a posteriori, are they doing the research to fulfill a, a preconceived notion? And also, are they doing the research because someone has paid them to get a certain outcome? Yes. And I can remember working with some professional football teams and the notion to them that flexibility had any useful transfer to the game was so frowned upon that if you were doing stretching exercises, they thought you were wasting your time. Yeah, and that still exists today in a lot of professional sports, which I find funny. But let's start there. Let's, okay. let's, let's start with that. So in this book, Ian talks about the what's called the specificity continuum. Oh, go back in focus. The specificity continuum. And it took, there's a lot of content in this, but I'll, I'll start with there. So before you go on, we have to look at, we've mentioned this numerous times, the somatic properties. Somatic just refers to the body. So they're the, the physical qualities, if you like, of the body. And there are four major qualities, speed, strength, flexibility, and endurance. And I add a fifth one on, which I call sturdiness, which is the impact resilience of the body, which you need in contact or impact activities, uh, full contact karate, football, things like rugby league, things like that. So I'll get your views on that one. Um, after we go through this one, if that's okay. So in the specificity continuum, means created a continuum left to right. And basically it means that the, the physical qualities each require training in different ways. Why? Because each of the physical qualities transfers to sport different to different degrees. As an example, flexibility and strength are more general, which basically means that you can do strength training and flexibility training and it will transfer to more sports and more activities in a positive way. And also, if I can add, what makes it general is that you can do fundamental strength movements, let's say deadlifts, squats, bench presses, rows, chin ups, steps, rows, yes. these sort of things, and they will transfer over to an, an activity which doesn't necessarily have those exact movements, whereas other activities 
will not do that at all virtually. Exactly. And then we move to more the right side of the continuum and speed is the next one on the right side of the continuum, which means what? Speed's typically thought of as, you know, the fastest 60 or 100 metre sprinter in the world, right? They're the fastest person in the world. But put them in a boxing ring, put them in a kickboxing ring, put them in an MMA cage, put them in a Kyokushin dojo, and they may, may, may not necessarily be fast because the speed that they develop running in a straight line with no opposition, just running, is different to the speed required to the punch, to kicks, to distance, to angles, rhythm, timing, and so on that's required. And then we get to more speed. Um, the, the final part of the specificity continuum, which is endurance. And endurance needs to be trained extremely specifically. In other words, essentially doing the sport. Yes, and that's very true. And a, a simple one simple way to look at it is you find elite athletes in 10 different sports, and I can guarantee that their training programs will not even resemble each other. Yep. The training program for a swimmer, for a marathon runner, for a sprinter, a sprinter, for a trap shooter, for a uh, a um, uh, a long distance skier. Oh yeah, cross country skier. Uh, they're Ultra all marathon runner. Yeah, they're, they're just completely France. different. Yeah. And the reason they're different was if they if this concept of transfer wasn't relevant, everyone would do exactly the same thing. But because transfer is so specifically relevant, it's necessary that not only do people in different sports ch change their training program. People within the sports will have different programs according to their own uh, events that are coming up, but also their own physical physical qualities yes, and so on that they're gifted with. And on this concept, Sean, where would you place sturdiness, the impact resilience on that continuum? I would say that there's a large degree of general uh, um, transfer in that um, the way you strengthen your body with makiwara training with leg conditioning, with body conditioning, is very general. Of course. Uh, you can take certain areas of more specific uh, sturdiness training, but in general, I would put sturdiness training way over on the left, left. with strength and, and flexibility, flexibility training. Of course. Very interesting. So we have the somatic transfer. We have the transfer of those physical qualities. And as Mitch mentioned, strength training and flexibility training have a much more general transfer so you can select an intelligent range of strength exercises and an intelligent range of flexibility exercises and generally speaking they will impact very beneficially on your activity but if you want to go if you want to do endurance training there's no point in preparing for a tournament by doing 100 meter sprints in the pool or swimming yeah that sort of thing because the, and you can see that when you see highly conditioned athletes from one activity coming over into another that they, they they have no not only one activity but a different range within that particular activity yes so they're the four the four main uh, somatics strength speed endurance and flexibility and they all transfer differently uh in that continuum okay um did you want to add anything to? No, that's generally it for transferring physical preparation into a sport. But ultimately, the ultimate transfer happens and adaptations happen by playing the sport, or doing the activity. So in, if we're talking about karate or kyokushin karate, we're talking about doing the kihon, doing the aido kihon, doing the kata, doing the conditioning, doing the kumite. Very much so. And... You know, there's. You could argue that different people train for different reasons. Even Itosu Anku point, Anko pointed out when he did his, um, what is now known as the Itosu Jukun or the ten precepts of Itosu Anko, and he points out that you can train karate for physical health, and you can train karate for realistic fighting. You just have to be clear which one you're training for, because without it, there is no transfer. And you can, you can train in a very, very Manila, st vanilla sort of style in, in karate and never learn how to fight you out of a paper bag. The problem is if you think that that general sort of training gives you any fight skills, then you're in trouble yes. because you don't have the experience. You don't extend your training beyond your comfort zone to take into account non-compliance and non-compliant opponents 
to the point where you build experience in those confrontational situations. I think that's very, very uh, important. Um, and within karate, we have this problem where we do the kihon with a very static movement. And then we do the footwork, even karate footwork, even good karate footwork could be argued as being quite static. The forward, the very lineal forward motion. It's only when you start to change angles, change your distance, uh, that you can really get a handle on the transfer of the basic techniques into a more fluid style. And we have a concept called Kosaho, which basically kind of means simultaneous um, striking and defense. If someone throws a punch in karate, the general, I understand that's different for some people, the general approach is I block that punch and counter. We have Kosaho, which kind of means simultaneous block and counter. So now you might go block and counter. And you, you teach that and they go, wow, that's pretty cool. But the reality is you look at even an average amateur boxing match and the fighters are doing exactly exactly that from round to round, from exchange to exchange. They're moving their head off. They're moving and they're hitting. They're slipping and throwing the punch at the same time. So they have a very, very fluid transfer of their techniques that they practice into their fighting because there is no formality so to speak there is no uh generalized non-specific training that we often see in karate so i think that's that becomes a real challenge for karate is how do you transfer that static movement and static footwork into fluidity and I think that's the real the real challenge for an instructor, how to take your students from being really good at Kihon to really good at Kumite. And Kihon, of course, being everything that you do that is not the real event. It's interesting, that topic that you talk about, Kihon being everything you do that's not the event. Ian King says a similar thing. He says all training is non-specific unless it's the actual sporting event. So he's talking from a sports point of view you're talking from a, a, a martial arts point of view, but the concepts you could lay on each other and they're exactly the same. There you go. Now, we often talk about five ranges, kick, punch, head, butt, elbow, stand up, grappling, and ground. And Mitch pointed out something very interesting. The Kyokushin, the general Kyokushin tournament ranges, one and two, they don't transfer well from when you're drilling it to the real situation. In terms of impact and reality and pressure and timing and distance simply because of the the impact. impact whereas stand up grappling and groundwork transfer very well because you actually do the full technique with 100 percent application and your opponent just taps out okay or you just tap out so that's the beauty this is why people who get into grappling uh have a very high transfer um trajectory because they're actually, realistically, you take the tap away and the person doing the technique kept doing the technique, they would die. You know, you're talking about chokes chokes and strangles and so on. That would kill you if you didn't tap. Or joint locks, you literally break their joints. Yeah, you break their joints, things like that. So this is why in karate it's a real challenge for us to be able to transfer range one and two, the kicks and punches. How do we, and this is the challenge not just for us, but the challenge is, Go back, going back to the masters, the day of the early masters, um, how do they transfer that? You know, do they do it through secret death matches? Do they, you know, and realistically, that's what it really is. I mean, if you've got two guys that are really going hard with no gloves, the first thing they do is you put protection on. Go, okay, well, if we want to get real, let's put protection on. Well, that immediately changes your technique. You go from a fist that big to a fist that big because of the glove which means I go like this and someone throws a hook and my chances of blocking it with a glove on are infinitely higher than the chances of my doing anything except knocking myself out with a fist. So that affects your technique. Now you've got a glove, you can come in like this. Without a glove, you have to come in like this. And also, Sean, something I've learned from you is without a glove, the concept of hard, soft and soft hard comes into it. Because if you punch hard with the, your fist, 
your fist may not end up that well after a couple of shots. Yeah. So it changes the techniques that you might use as well. Yeah, the, the concept of hitting hard with soft and soft with hard is very important. If you want to hit bone, hit with the muscle like the palm heel and so on. If you want to hit um, muscle, use your fist so it's hard. That's one way to look at it too. I think that's, that's very important. And the concept that um, we often talk about, a block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. That's simply a form of transfer. The technique, the, the basic technique you learn is a block, but it also turns into a lock. It also turns into a, a jolt, a, a, a blow. It also turns into a throw. And that is a probably the ultimate form of technical transfer, that you can take a technique and transfer it into one of those concepts, block, block, blow, throw. I think that's very important. Um, and you were mentioning earlier, Sean, um, about kata, and a lot of people, or you, you mentioned soul, so I said in the past that kata is so important, but people see it sometimes as dance aspects rather than the truly um, martial aspect of kata that transfers enormously to real life. Well, one of soul Sai's most beautiful quotes is the life of karate is in the kumite. The, the foundation, the kihon of kumite is kata. The kihon of kata is moving basics, kihon, ido kihon. The kihon of ido kihon is kihon, and the kihon of kihon is flexibility. So even Solsai pointed out that the most important quality to transfer well into technical perfection is uh, flexibility. And when you're talking about uh, the kata and using transfer from the kata into a realistic form of uh, fighting, well, then that's the, see, that's the challenge of bunkai and application, being able to take those kata, which are generally dominant in a very stiff, very precise way, and freeing it up so that it becomes a realistic technique. And that is the, the, the whole sum total of the research of Bunkai and Oyo applications. Uh, Miyagi Chojun, when he created what is now known as Kaisai no Gendi, he pointed out that before he called it Kaisai no Gendi, which is basically the, the, the foundation of the breakdown of um, technique, he called it Musubi to, Toki to Musubi no Gendi. Toki to Musubi no Gendi. Toki means the unraveling, and Musubi means the tying. That's why Musubi Dachi, or when you say you tie a belt in Japanese, you say Obio Musubu. Okay? So Miyagi Chojin was talking about you take a kata and you take those knot points, K N O T. He didn't say that, I call it that. But those knot points. And you unwind, unravel, untie those knot points and train them and understand them and connect with them. And then you retie them again, but with a different understanding. And that's where transfer and kata is so valuable and so important. Who goes there? One person out of a hundred actually takes to the point where they look at a technique. I think it's become more prevalent in the last 30 years or so. Uh, when I say prevalent, I'm sure there are people who were doing it 100 years ago. And that's clearly obvious because you have people like Miyagi Chojun writing about the concept of bunkai, breaking them down. Um, but since, particularly since UFC and the introduction of grappling and and sometimes the embarrassing result of stand-up fighters who don't know how to grapple getting in there and getting smashed by even beginner grapplers. So that's brought this to the surface more where people are now researching technique and pulling them apart and so on. I'm going to have a quick look at the messages. Rochelle, us, Marco, Matus, us, us, Sensei, Mike. Interesting how people believe general training will lead to specific skills. Well, there you go. That's the whole um, misunderstanding of transfer in a nutshell. I do karate. I can stand there. Therefore, look out. I'm a killer in, in a real situation. And you get in and 
you throw the punch and the guy looks at you and goes, what was that, a mosquito or did yeah. you slip? Are yeah. you okay? And you see the videos online even on YouTube. You can see someone that's done a certain limited training in martial arts go against someone that competes regularly and you see a, a massive mismatch in skills. Very and, and this is the psychological transfer techniques of mind control and breath control and we all talk about um, um, mushin and all this sort of thing and and uh, we all learn how to use breathing tech we talk about it we talked about it last week probably where you use breathing techniques to calm your mind under pressure and so on um how to deal with that pressure with a, a very calm mental poise you know that's a form of transfer the reality is the only way you get it is experience and so this is what mitch is referring to there is when you actually have this situation where uh, you do a certain style of training, basics, moving basics, so on, and you expect that to transfer over to reality without the experience of reality. It's just a joke. And this is why so many martial arts, and I love how you can fool some of the people all the time, but they there are, uh, I could name five of them off the top of my head, who just convince people that what they have is so dangerous they can't compete in competition yeah. because the techniques they use are illegal and the techniques they would use would probably kill the opponent and so on. But the reality is if I had a if I would take someone who's trained traditionally, for example, GSP, and put him against one of those people, I know where my money would go simply because of the experience of transfer. Everything that GSB has done over the years, has he has narrowed down his style of training and then what he is doing to ensure that he has optimal transfer into the ring. Whereas these people that say, well, we don't fight in, you know, in sport because it's too dangerous or too that it's, they have zero experience of transfer. And that psychological transfer is very important too, that ability to stand up in a confrontation against a highly violent, highly trained opponent and remain poised under pressure. That takes real experience, I think. Marco, any thoughts on Francis? No, I just think, you know, it's bound to come undone. <laughs> if you, you know, you know, some people get away with it for a while. I guess knowing why what you're training for is important here, as you just said, but how many are introduced to hoisting when they enter the dojo. You have to remind me what hoshin means off the top of my head. I'm not sure, unless I saw the kanji for it. But it's very true. Um, and that goes back to Itosu Anko when he says, see if I can find his techniques. I'll have a quick look for I think um, it's really important. I'm just looking for the actual words, but I may not be able to find them off. But Itosu Anko basically said that you can train karate for physical culture, in other words, for health and so on, or you can train karate for real fighting. But like Mike says, guess knowing why and what you're training for is important. Well, that's what he tells you, Uncle, Uncle said. You just have to be clear which one you're doing. Are you training for health and, you know, physical culture or are you training to be a real fighter? Well, just make sure you get that um, correct. I'm just seeing if I can find the actual... There we go. I've got it. So the 10 mottos, the precepts, the 10 precepts of Itosu Anko. Correct. 
karate is not simply a form of physical exercise aimed at one's own benefit. Its practice also serves society at large, not simply for one-on-one -on -one contact skills, but rather for the prote protection of oneself and others. That's not the one I'm looking at. Determine, this is point number seven, determine if your karate will be primarily aimed at cultivating the body for health or cultivating skills for realistic practical application. Then train accordingly. And that's 110 years old, you know, So, but we still get it wrong. We still think that because we train in a certain way, its transfer will be automatic. The transfer will not be automatic. You have to understand the process of transfer and how to bridge that gap. That's what the word Kaizen, a very popular word, the, the constant improvement means. You have to keep questioning your training and finding ways to transfer it over to reality. How much do you think joint flexibility range of movement affects performance? Mitch? Enormously. Depending on the performance, of course, if you're just a deadlifter in a powerlifting comp, well, you only have to move the bar about 50 centimetres, 75 centimetres from the floor. So flexibility, you know, you don't need too much of it, but as far as in the martial arts goes, enormously. And if you think about certain positions, Sean, we do them all the time, you know, like Kimuras and um, Americanas and so on. If you haven't got good internal, external flexibility of the shoulders, you'll be tapping far earlier and get far more injured than those that have better range. So, yeah, enormously. I think the word performance there, Craig, too, is interesting. You've got performance in terms of uh, the outcome of the event. You've also got performance in terms of your ability to be resilient and your ability to handle uh, the pressures and intensity of training. That's another form of performance. Absolutely, it is. At, sure. the, at the end of the year, if, if you don't have a range of uh, an increased flexibility and range of motion in your joints, you will break down. You will have a higher range, a higher volume of injury over time, simply because if that's your range of, if that's your range of motion, then about that is your usable range of motion. But if that's your range of motion, that's your usable range of motion. So if you're only that flexible, anything beyond there is going to hurt you. But if that's your range of flexible, that doesn't worry you. You're still comfortable. And in a grappling situation, being comfortable under pressure is 90% of it. Of course, you know, it is a bit when you, when you think a different, when you think that, a block can be a stick a strike sure. or a blow yes you do think differently if you think in terms of your defense and blocking you recognize for example that when i cover i can drive that elbow forward and the, suddenly that cover becomes an attack as well it and when you're aware of that it changes the way you think and you relate to your opponent i find that some body bon committee help with the fluid of the key on if done correctly by correctly i mean not choreograph, but rather as receiving a, as opposing to meet the force with force. Yeah, receiving, good point. Blocking is not a block. <laughs> Blocking is receiving something and redirecting the energy more to the point. Or shin purpose, there you go. How many introduced, but how many introduced to the purpose when they enter a dojo? Not many, exactly. In fact, I would argue that 90% of the time, the instructor hides the hoshin or the hoshin, hides the hoshin, hides the purpose for fear of losing students. You know, if they say to students, well, you can come in and train, but if you really want to be a fighter, that's a different level of training. What we do is actually just, you know, it's fitness work, to be quite honest. And half the time, it's not even that, I guess. So it's, that's a good point. Um, if you're an honest instructor, you need to be comfortable with introducing the realities of training in terms of transfer. Transfer is, it's a vitally important subject and you, it's well worth studying, not just for the somatics, which men, Mitch mentioned uh, that Ian King, particularly, we mention Ian King all the time, that's Mitch's um, athletic training um, mentor. And Ian's original innovations in the industry uh, breathtaking a phenomenal so many things that you yourself would do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of 
developing strength and conditioning programs, I can guarantee that Ian King was the one who originally uh, innovated and thought of them. And this is a, a book legacy cricket in stage, yeah. and that's a whole oh, bunch of it. Ian's training innovations um, over the years. <laughs> so it's Where a few minutes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's fantastic. Where are you, Shia? It's a fantastic book. Um, and, and, and yeah, Shia Cam's right. It's, uh, there's a lot of great stuff that Ian's done and shared and so on. So we mentioned him a lot. I, I tend to, um, cause he's had such a huge influence on me. Okay. So there you have it. That's transfer. And I think last week we talked a lot about, um, recovery, recovery. And I think recovery and transfer are like brother and sister. They need to go together because one of the most important parts of training transfer is understanding the intensity and the volume of certain types of training so that it transfers better and to look at it in our own training as well so we, we move it from the theory to practical and if we're in a tournament or in a grading or whatever it happens to be some sort of event or maybe you're in a confrontation with a someone who's um intended to hurt you a non-compliant person who's intended to hurt you randomly and look at how we respond right and we look back and go gee what i did worked or it didn't really work and i've got to make some changes there i think that's a very important point not to miss as well yep very much so a person's pushing is important knowing why you're training what you want the outcome of all your efforts to produce so many just go along with what they're told or expected expected to yeah that's a good point um, very much so. This is why I, I always say that you need to ask the good questions because good questions give good answers. And what uh, Sensei Mike's talking about there is exactly what Itosu Anku Anko pointed out when he talked about uh, that point seven in his 10 points where he says you have to determine from the very beginning. In other words, de determining from the beginning is establishing your purpose. Determine from the beginning, are you aiming your training at cultivating physical health or are you aiming your training at cultivating superior fighting skills? It's, it's realistically you get there's a crossover, but they're not the same thing. You have to train accordingly. Uh, one is very different to the other. Thank you, guys. Good to see you again. Look forward to seeing you next week. I hope you got something out of that. I think transfer is very very important and worthy of very deep study so that you understand how what you're doing transfers well to training okay it's good to see you again and look forward to seeing you next week